live from New York City for our audience worldwide. Bloomberg Real Yield starts right now. Coming up, more workers returning to the labor force, taking two-year Treasury yields lower as economists dream of a soft landing. We begin with a big issue, setting the stage for the Fed's next move. It's a good number. The labor force participation rate number is really the key uh, takeaway. The labor force itself. That is the most interesting piece. The Fed is looking at inflation, inflation, inflation. What does the report signal about any kind of inflation look through it. The labor market in general just screams for a much higher terminal rate. We all are focused on the economy. The economy is in pretty good shape. But the Fed is focused on inflation. The look through to inflation. The economy could just sit there and it could do what it wants. At the end of this, you're likely to get something that's more of a hard landing. It's going to be quite hard to put this economy into a recession. For the Fed to bring this plane in and a soft landing would be extraordinary. I still think the Fed's going 75 basis points this meeting. They're just going to keep going. And they couldn't be possibly more clear. Joining us now to discuss is Sock Gen, Sabadra Schaffer, P. James Robert Tip, and George Concarves of MUFG. Sabadra, I want to come first to you. How would you characterize the jobs report of earlier this morning? It's a stellar job re report by any any measure, and I think that the um, the increase in the participation rate is the icing on the cake, because that really sends uh, gets more people into the workforce. It keeps wages subdued, and uh, it's really what the Fed wants to see if it wants to orchestrate a soft landing. I mean, going into uh, you know the next uh, you know three, three, two or three weeks in, ahead of the September FOMC meeting. We'll be looking to see what we get in the CPI data on September 13th. I think if you get a 0.4 uh, increase month over month in the month of August in, in core CPI, then the Fed is very much on track perhaps to deliver a 75 basis point rate hike, given the, the, the absolute strength of the, econo uh, of, the, um, of the employment report as well as the economy in the recent data. This is the viewer city as well, that ultimately, yes, it's got that Goldilocks feel to it, but it's 75 again in September for City. They said the following, it does not substantially change the narrative for the Fed. Inflation is too high, the labor market's too tight. We continue to expect a 75 basis point rate hike at the September FOMC meeting. Robert Tip, do you agree with that? I think that is entirely plausible. And I think given the comments coming out of the Fed in recent weeks, it would not be at all surprising to see them do 75 basis points. If I was just looking at the data, though, uh, their chief indicator on inflation, core PCE, has moderated a bit. And the part of the economy that would be most likely to be impacted by the increase in rates, real estate, has really had a dramatic move. And the new home sales, existing home sales, and home prices as well, a, a drop off in housing activity. Uh, a skidding to a stop in the appreciation of home prices, you know, that kind of a dramatic shift. It's only a couple months worth of data, uh, but that dramatic of a shift, I would think, would warrant uh, a, a more measured approach, a 50 basis point, or if they go 75, they try to keep the market from pricing in uh, too much tightening in those uh, out, out months. Robert Tip, wouldn't that unwind the hard work of the Federal Reserve chairman? in Jackson Hole just one week ago. Wouldn't that unwind well, some think, of that effort? Yeah, I mean, they don't want the market to excessively ease financial conditions. Um, the market, you know, had a corner priced in that they were going to get to a peak Fed funds rate in the early spring, in the winter of next year, and then bang, rates were going to start coming down. Well, they've cured that problem. You have a, a summit in rates now that spreads out through a good part of next year. So basically a year of high rates from now in the high threes. And the Fed funds rate right now is about two and three eighths, right? So 150 basis points, they move and they stay there. Uh, so they have quite a bit priced in and they're beginning to see that it's really bit. So I, I do, I agree with you. They want to keep the rates high. Um, but by the same token, uh, if, if they move too aggressively right here, and it turns out some of their other comments have been correct, that we are going to see the impact on a lagged basis. And the sudden deceleration in real estate was the impact of the prior 75 basis points, and they've just thrown another 75 at it. 
you know, they may be creating more volatility in some of these parts of the economy than, than they would like. George, what's your take? I think that's, you know, I, I kind of agree with what Rob's saying in terms of the plateau, but the thing is, when, when we're living through it, we just don't know if the financial conditions tightening is enough. And, you know, look, it's it's come off a little bit. We, we've, we've had stocks, you know, bounce back today. I mean, a rough finish to August. But I, I just don't think that the, the work is done on financial conditions. They need to do a lot more. And it's not just the, you know, the plateau and this higher summit of rates that's going to do it. It's going to be the constant pressure that they're going to say, we're going to stay on, on hold or keep rates high. And also, you know, maintain the QT. I mean, that, the QT, I think, now is where the rubber hits the road starting in September throughout the rest of the year. That with the rate hikes and, and, and being committed to it and unwaveringly, uh, you know, in it's, that sort of fashion, I think that's what's going to really tighten uh, financial conditions. But we have not had enough, in my opinion. And that's why we've got a Fed call right now and not a Fed put. And I think the equity market gets the joke because even earlier this morning, we had what many economists would call had a Goldilocks feel to it. It looked like the kind of picture that if you extrapolated it out, you could dream for a moment, maybe a couple of hours, that you could engineer a soft landing, get participation up, get price pressure down and maybe not push rates too far. But ultimately, if we're in this world, George, of QT and a Fed call and no longer a Fed put, that's going to put a bit of a lid on risk, isn't it, through at least the next couple of months? A absolutely. And not only that, I mean, look, it's a global phenomenon. The inflation problem is both global and then the reaction from central banks is global. Uh, and, and that reaction is, uh, you know, doesn't, they're not coordinated per se, but the fact that we're seeing this global rise in rates, you know, for years, term premium has been compressed in the U.S. and we benefited tremendously from low European rates, low uh, Japanese rates. That, those days are likely gone. And if that's true, then this high, if higher term premium really comes back in, then I think we'll get financial conditions tightening. But, you know, again, we still, it's early days in that process. You brought up QT. I want to talk about QT and maybe get some detail from all three if you want it. So, Patrick, I tried to press... Fed officials last week in Jackson Hole, what QT meant to them. And I have to say, I didn't get a clear picture of what any of it means whatsoever. And I have to say also from conversations I've had on shows like this one, it seems that we don't really know what kind of impact balance sheet reduction of this scale at this pace is actually going to have on financial conditions. What's your best guess right now, Sabadra? I think the first order impact of QT is going to be to try to remove the excess liquidity in the system. I mean, we've got over two trillion in the overnight RRP program, so some of that liquidity needs to come out. For now, a lot of that liquidity is coming out of out of uh, bank balance sheets, and and that will eventually shift towards, you know, perhaps draining some of the excess reserves in the overnight RRP. But beyond that, really, the transmission mechanism of QT is going to come over time as you know, new supply hits the market and the Fed's not there to be the backstop buyer of all this new supply and someone else has to come in and take down that supply. And that's really when you start seeing the term premium build in. I mean, to be clear, QT is not the opposite of QE. So you're not going to really see a meaningful build up in term premium right off the get go. But, uh, you know, that's something that will happen over time. What I'm really concerned about, about with QT is the fact that uh, a lot of the, the, the reason why the Fed purchased a lot of assets in the first place is to provide liquidity in the Treasury market. And my concern is that as they kind of step away from the market and, and uh, start tightening uh, liquidity in the system, then you might see some disruptions in the, in the Treasury market and, and the sort of secondary market trading and the liquidity in the Treasury market might deteriorate further. And that's really what I'm watching closely right now because liquidity conditions have, have worsened almost to, to the point where we were back in March of 2020. So that's something that the Fed has to be tracking very closely as they're unwinding their balance sheet. Robert Tip, your take? Yeah, I, I think it is having a big impact. I think you may not see it in term premium, I think you see it in a couple ways in the market. One of them is the spread between the cheapest securities in the market that are less liquid and the most liquid, richer securities in the market. That spread has widened. Bid offers on off-the-run treasuries have widened. And I think the fragility in the non-treasury markets uh, has really increased. And so I think that, uh, you know, what we saw over the summer when rates were going up corporate markets effectively closing down in terms of new issuance, I think is a function of the Fed draining liquidity. So I think that, um, you know, on balance, that's a part of the tightening financial conditions. I think the Fed, once that soft landing, uh, they can hike towards these forwards. 
Uh, they don't want the market to, to rally and take the tightening out of the system. But I think this overall balance of low liquidity um, creates a, an environment where people are already reticent to take risk because it's hard to move that risk once you get it on. So I, I think it is having an impact. To go a step further, it's also not just about the Fed. George, we're trying to engineer a soft landing and people might be getting excited about the data this morning, and it's good in that regard. But we're trying to engineer a soft landing on a very, very narrow landing strip. And you've got all these cross currents around, and QT's a part of that, tighter monetary policy, financial conditions, and all of the above. But then, George, you've got Europe, too. The headline that crossed about an hour ago, that Gazprom is going to keep Nord Stream shut, is just another big blow to Europe. We know that that ECB next week is going to hike anywhere between 50 and 70 basis points, 75 basis points. And we've been told, not just by Fed Chair Jay Powell, but also by Isabel Schnabel of the ECB, that they are willing to tolerate a recession and carry on hiking. The Bundesbank, you might expect it from the Bundesbank, but they said the same thing in the last week. A recession should not deter us from doing what we need to do, and we need to act decisively. With that in mind, George, the Fed's trying to engineer this stuff, but the Fed's not acting alone. There's other forces at play here. How are you considering right. those forces? 100 percent. And that's the whole point. This, this elevated uncertainty and it's, again, a global rates phenomenon in response to you know, the uncertainty on the inflation front. But you know, there's things that are outside the control of the ECB as well in terms of you know, gas production and supply. So, I mean, there's, this, there's the same argument can be made for the Fed. But nonetheless, they still have to at least you know, show the conviction to get inflation under control and, and see it actually start to turn the other uh, turn around and head lower. And they don't have evidence of that yet. And we might get that towards the end of the year and into the early part of next year. That's a long time waiting. And we have September, which notoriously could be a very volatile month for a lot of different reasons. I mean, a lot of corporate supply in the U.S. probably they're going to take advantage of that window to issue paper. I think, and I've said it a thousand times, <laughs> this morphs from a, from a rate risk to a credit risk. And that's yep. what's going to end up you know, stopping the Fed eventually. With that in mind, and Sabatra, a final word here, do you think we're still underestimating the pain that this Fed is willing to tolerate and the length of time that they're willing to wait to make sure, and I mean really make sure, that this inflation genie is back in the bottle? Yeah, I, the question is whether the markets are willing to tolerate the pain that the Fed is, is willing to inflict. Um, I mean, I think Chair Powell was very, very clear in his message at the uh, at the Jackson Hole meeting that they're singularly focused on inflation. They want to get uh, the Fed funds rate as high as they possibly can, uh, and that's going to uh, be uh, you know have an impact on both uh, you know individuals as well as businesses. And they're willing to they're communicating that very, very clearly. They're saying that there's going to be job losses. They're saying that there's going to be uh, further tightening of financial conditions, and that even you know when they get to the terminal Fed funds rate, they're going to keep policy uh, restrictive for perhaps a while after they get to the terminal Fed funds rate. So the question is, what happens to financial conditions under those circumstances? So far, the U.S. has been very, very resilient. The economy has been very resilient. I just don't know if that's going to be the case into, say, middle or end of next year when, uh, you know, higher interest rates and tighter financial conditions really start taking a bite uh, out of the economy. Sabadja, so Robert, George, you're going to be sticking with us. Just to get you up to speed on the headlines that crossed about an hour ago from Gazprom. Gazprom out of Russia said its key gas pipeline to Europe, Nord Stream 1, can't reopen as planned tomorrow as a new technical issue has been discovered. No idea how much clarity any of you have got on that or whether that's actually the reason, but was this a reason to sell or an excuse to sell? Because this equity market rolled over pretty quickly. We're negative a third of 1% on the day on the S&P 500. Euro got sold, as you might expect. Euro dollar just about positive on the session, rolling over in a big way, 99.64 on Euro dollar. The move that sticks is the move of the front end of the yield curve in America on Treasuries, a two-year down about 10 basis points. Up next on this program, the auction block. U.S. borrowers remaining on hold through the Labor Day holiday. That conversation, up next.
Live from New York City, I'm Jonathan Ferro. This is Bloomberg Real Yield. Let's get to the auction block where we kick things off in the United States. High-grade bond sales going quiet to close out a busy August. Monthly issuance topping estimates, even with just three small deals the past two weeks. The junk bond market recording a second straight week without a single debt sale. Borrowers on hold through the long weekend after pricing $9 billion this month. And finally in Europe, market-wide debt sales topping €39 billion Euros this week, with Wednesday marking the busiest single day since late May. Sticking with Europe, Morgan Stanley's Andrew Sheets bracing for a hard landing. Europe is in a, a difficult position. We are below consensus on growth in Europe. We, we do think that Europe will see a recession uh, uh, in the, the back half of this year. That puts the ECB in a difficult position. We do not think the ECB will, will move 75, but we do think they'll continue to hike and they will continue to be hiking into this weaker growth backdrop. Sabandra, so Robert, George, back with us. Sabandra, so you put a note out yesterday evening. It's a really good read just on the Italian 10-year, German 10-year spread. Do you really think that can blow out to about 300 basis points again? Well, it's possible, right? I mean, I think I, I agree with Andrew in the sense that uh, the ECB is in a very tough spot from a policy perspective. But unlike the U.S., where the, the Fed actually got a little bit ahead of the game, delivered a bunch of, of rate hikes, the ECB is just really only getting started. So for the most part, they're going to have to raise rates aggressively. Uh, at SOCGEN, we're calling for a 75 basis point rate hike at, at, at the September meeting, and perhaps another 50 uh, basis points at the following meeting, another 25 basis points in the meeting after. So a very aggressive path of rate hikes uh, for this year is what we have, uh, you know, pencil then, you know, the, the ECB is not really embarking on, on QT like, like the Fed is. So in some respects, their only policy tool right now is to, is to, is to raise rates. And like you mentioned, the, 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 the Treasury bond spreads, uh, you know, you're seeing a, a significant amount of, 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 of uh, narrowing there, given the fact that ECB, uh, I'm sorry, uh, bond yields have gone up quite dramatically. BTPs are approaching, uh, you know, close to 4 percent. So, you know, for the, for the most part, I think that the, the ECB is playing catch up and they're going to have to, to raise aggressively to, is, to address some of the issues uh, on the inflation front. One of the issues that's got my attention this week and I think it's becoming a much, much bigger conversation, is we've seen a big move in yields through Europe. And the UK is maybe a decent case study at the moment. Um, 94 basis points on a 10-year gilt through the month of August. We've had yields up, expectations for higher rates being built into the curve. And at the same time, the currency is depreciated. Now, Robert Tip, there is a conversation about maybe some kind of fiscal risk premium being built into some of these bond markets, that they're going to need to offset some of this pain in the energy market, do more on the fiscal side, but the bond market's not going to be wide open in the same way, with a central bank tightening, tightening policy, with QT replacing QE, with inflation being high and not low anymore. Robert, how wide open do you think this bond market is going to be for a fiscal effort in the UK and perhaps elsewhere too? I think uh, the, the UK uh, guilt market you know, has, has been subject to so many different risk factors and the uh, credit markets there, you know, become perennially less liquid than their European counterparts. And, uh, you know, it's a function of their separation uh, from the European market uh, and then the, the instability, uh, some of which has always been there. The currency has been a perennially uh, weak currency because of their external accounts. But then the political noise has come in and has uh, exacerbated that. So, you know, it's not a market that's going to completely unhinge, um, but it is uh, definitely uh, the most difficult one to, to handicap and most subject to uh, volatility and illiquidity. George, what's your take on these developments in the last couple of weeks, the last month? Sure. I mean, so really an unwind of the move that we saw in, in July. There was a you know, big rally. And then we sold off even more so from European rates and, and, and guilt rates. And I, I think, you know, that, that's, again, goes back to the earlier point around you know, the beta back to U.S. Treasuries is not zero. It's actually pretty, it's positive in a, in, a, in a decent way. And, you know, most of these markets are going to become more domestic focused and their domestic investors are going to have to underwrite their debt and they're going to be less from overseas buyers. To attract those overseas buyers. George, does that mean a depreciation in, the, depreciation in the currency? Does the FX channel do the heavy lifting? Or is it just a fact that we need to get yields up to attract that capital? Is that the story now for the Europeans? George? 
think we might have lost George Concarvis there. So, Badra, I'm sure you heard the question. Can you help me answer it? Yeah, I can. I, yes, I did. Absolutely. I'm happy to answer that. Um, I, I, I definitely agree. I think, uh, you know, to George's point, I think you look at, uh, you know, the, tr the attractiveness of treasuries or bonds or, or any of the other European government bonds for foreign investors, especially Japanese investors, on a currency-adjusted basis, what you see is that the, the returns are not very attractive. So in some respects, if you're sort of relying on foreign demand for, for global bonds, then you're going to need to see much higher yield levels from where you, where you are right now. And a lot of it has to do with the strength in the, in the currency. I mean, the dollar especially has been extraordinarily strong. So, you know, in some respects, you're going to need to see some, some more of a concession before you start seeing, you know, foreign investors coming back in the market. The other consideration there is the fact that, you know, bond markets, you know, globally have been extraordinarily volatile. Yeah. Typically, when there's this level of volatility, you don't see foreign investors come in, step in uh, to, to buy in, and, and uh, you know, participate in the bond markets. It's been a global story, that's for sure, through the month of August and into September as well. So, Badger, Robert, George, sticking with us. I think we've got a technical issue with George. We're going to try and re-establish that. Still ahead, the final spread, the week ahead, featuring an ECB rate decision and more remarks from Chair Powell. That's coming up. Live from New York, I'm Jonathan Farrow. This is Bloomberg Real Yield. It's time now for the final spread. The week ahead coming up. U.S. markets closed on Monday. You knew that. On Tuesday, data, PMIs and ISM, Eurozone GDP Wednesday. We'll hear from President Messler and Chair Powell later in the week. Tons of Fed speak and an ECB rate decision and comments from President Lagarde. Let's get you the rapid fire round. Three quick questions, three quick answers. First to this, 50 or 75 in September for the Fed. So Badger, 50 or 75? 75. Robert? 50. George? 75. 50 or 75 for the ECB? Robert? 75. George? 75. Sabadra? 75. Who cuts rates first, the ECB or the Fed? George? The Fed. Sabadra? ECB? Robert? ECB. To the three of you, thank you. Enjoy the long weekend. Sabadra Rajapa, Robert Tibb, George Concarvis from New York City. That is it for me. I'll see you same time, same place next week. This was Bloomberg Real Yield for our audience worldwide. You enjoy the long weekend here stateside. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg.